this concept of finding myself in my work as a photographer. So I started out as a painter, sculptor, all kinds of crazy things that I did before really dialing in on becoming a photographer. And this is a presentation that hits really near and dear to myself and I really just wanna share it with you. It's my journey leading up to me as a photographer and why I do what I do and how I do what I do. So when we, the, the name and the title of this presentation is Finding You in Your Work. Okay, so if we look at this series of images, a lot of these might seem very familiar to you. And uh, you might look at this and say, uh, well, I see you. You are definitely right here and right here. Those, that's Blake, right? Now, but this is not literally finding yourself somewhere in your work, okay? This is about your work being defined by you to the point that people know your work based on your style and who you are as an artist to create the works that you create. So. Literally, I am in these two uh, spots right here, here, and here, but I am everywhere in all of these images. All of these images are in some way, shape, or form Blake Rudis. They've got my touch to them, they've got my artistic, artistic representation to them, and they are a representation of me. They're like a lot of little mini self-portraits of Blake Rudis. And I want you to start considering your work the exact same way, that everything that you create is essentially a mini self-portrait of who you are. So your work, and, and your your style comes out in your work as who you are. Now, a lot of the things I teach are technical style things, but I don't necessarily go into this really metaphysical concept of how to find yourself in your work and how to consider yourself an artist. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about now. We're going to not talk about anything technical, and we're just going to focus on you and you becoming an artist and not just calling yourself a photographer, okay? So this is what we're going to talk about. I'm going to reflect on myself. I'm going to talk about my motivation and how I got to where I am today. I'm going to talk about you being an artist or a photographer, and I'm going to talk to you about how you can find yourself in your work. Now, typically the way I start this off is uh, when I'm live, I say, okay, raise your hand if you consider yourself an artist. In this group of 80 to 100 people, I think maybe seven people raised their hand and actually considered themselves an artist. And that's really a shocking thing that I want to break. There was 80 to 100 people in this room and seven of them, not even 10%, raise their hand to say that they're an artist, there's something wrong there because I believe you're, a, you're an artist and not necessarily a photographer. And I'm going to talk about ways that you can actually uh, walk away from this and, and represent yourself in your work. So actionable things that you can take away from this. Your style is not what you photograph. It is how you photograph it. I should have underlined you because everyone is going to photograph something differently. Therefore, your style is unique to you. And, you know, even when I go on workshops and stuff, this is true. I'll go on a workshop and we'll all be at the same location, basically sharing the exact same spot, all photographing the exact same thing. And then when we come to the critique table and everyone's showing their work, we all see some type of representation of those individuals in their images, even though there might have been 12 of us standing in the same spot. I've got a workshop coming up here in May, and I can't wait to do this all over again. It's, it's a lot of fun. So if you're writing notes, if you're taking things down, your style is not what you photograph. It's how you photograph it. And even if you want to take that a little bit further, it's how you make it in post-production as well. So let's do a little bit of self-reflection. Many of you know that I started out as a painter and I painted for years. I was actually got my degree in printmaking from, from the University of Delaware. And the reason why I liked printmaking so much is printmaking allowed me to um, um, do a little bit of everything. There's sculpture involved in printmaking. There's painting involved in printmaking. There's uh, drawing involved in printmaking. There's even uh, photography involved in printmaking. So there's a lot of different things that I could do with that printmaking, and that's why I got my degree in that. But I started out formally as a painter. Basically, from the age of, I don't know, when I could even pick up a pen, I started actually doing some watercolors, you know, with Crayola, obviously, because I was, I don't know, all of <laughs> uh, five or six years old when I started that. Uh, but then I transitioned into acrylic painting and oil painting um, and gouache and uh, all different types of of uh, gouache sounds like um, like squash, doesn't it? It's not a food, I guarantee you. It's, it's actually a very opaque form of watercolor, uh, kind of in the same lines of watercolor. But I did a lot of things with a lot of different mediums of paint. And I learned a lot from that. I learned a lot about color theory. I learned a lot about creating my own compositions. I learned a lot about um, just exploring different avenues that I probably wouldn't have if I was just into photography. 
I say that very specifically, just into photography as we progress through, you'll understand why. So what I was doing with my paintings though, is I often painted on the floor. Uh, I, I enjoyed painting on the floor. It probably wasn't the best for my back, but that was where I would, I could just paint. I could do four foot by six foot canvases there. I could paint whatever I wanted to. Um, but painting, uh, painting allowed me uh, the ability to explore color theory, design, um, all different, all different types of things. And if you look on the left hand side here, you'll see that it looks like there's masking tape all over the, 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 um, the painting. Well, I did layers. So I basically made masks with masking tape on my paintings, kind of like Photoshop meets painting, right? And then I would paint these things and pull the tape away and it would leave the design there. And then other times that was more of my uh, abstract stuff. On the right hand side, it's more of my literal things where I would literally, I would go out and I would take pictures with my camera. I'd find source images to paint. So this one was a parking garage that I was working on and that's me working on it with all my paints and stuff all over the place. And then the next one is what I came up with that. It was basically um, the idea that if, if I lived <laughs> homeless, a parking garage would be a great place for me to park my bed. Um, it was kind of a play on the homeless that I saw all over San Jose and Santa Clara and how I, I had these luxuries that I had in my house that these individuals don't have in their place where they lay their head. And the concept was basically just an awareness piece about the homeless and what they don't have versus what we have and how they probably don't even, and might not even care about the things that we have. But I would take pictures of things and then I would uh, go back to my, my uh, apartment and I'd paint them. But I was really frustrated with my literal uh, paint strokes. You can see here that you might actually like this. I don't like it. I can't stand it. Um, I can't stand the paint strokes. Uh, I wasn't happy with my style. So because I wasn't happy with my style, I kept exploring all different types of things like um, abstracts, taking the literal Bay Bridge in San Francisco and then trying to paint it in abstract. And this image on the right, it's, you know, what I did there was I specifically wanted to uh, try to put all of the complementary colors in their own little boxes and then paint things in there. And I was really doing a color study. And what ended up happening was I was doing a color study on things that don't look good together. So I learned never do that stuff again. Uh, uh, but I was playing with complements. I was playing with reverse complements. I was playing with all different types of things to understand how colors interact and how colors work. So when I tell you that I've explored color theory. I'm not lying when I say that I've, I've probably painted over 150 paintings that are all color theory based and they look a lot like this. Um, none of them are very good, but they allowed me to learn how color works. So when I bring that into the photography world, when I show you the things that I'm showing you in the photography world, you're seeing this from a painter's standpoint of color theory and how colors interact with, with the canvases. On the left, I actually enjoy that piece. I did kind of like that. Uh, the Bay Bridge was one of my favorites. Uh, I liked the Bay Bridge more than I liked the Golden Gate Bridge. So when I lived out there, I would paint that all the time. I did a series of seven paintings on the Bay Bridge uh, because I wanted to give it some love. Um, this is where I started to get kind of literal meets abstract with my Jackson Pollock meets Jasper Johns painting style. And I loved this. I explored this a lot. I really enjoyed this. And I even did some big, big ones. This is a four foot by six foot canvas. And it's about my, my trip from Delaware to California. Again, abstract work is really cool because it can tell a story and it can speak to individuals. And basically what this was, was if you look over here on the left, this was my path in Delaware leading me up to my transition into San Francisco. You can see a version of the Transamerica building right here in a very abstract. And this was my move from Delaware to California with California disrupting everything that I had ever learned, hence the electricity coming through and shocking my system, so to speak, uh, of how I grew up in Delaware. So I took a lot of these abstract concepts, all these, these um, philosophical ideas and put them together. And this is a really cool uh, painting. I actually hung this up, it's four foot by six foot it's on the way out of my basement into my office so that every day when I go to work, I remember these things. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk to you about finding those pivotal types of pieces to always put in front of your face in a little bit here. So here I started to work even more, a little bit literal and abstract, just using silhouettes. This was actually an abstract piece about me and my wife. Um, I am the, the Bay Bridge. I'm very structured. I'm very rigid. I have things that need to be done. And if they don't get done, I get upset. And if they, if they aren't perfect, then people don't get to travel. My wife, on the other hand, is like a tree. She just kind of blows with the breeze and she's a spontaneous one. And she likes to just say, hey, let's go to the city market. And I'm like, uh, we didn't plan that, babe. And she said, I know, that's why we're going to do it. So uh, we complement each other very well. And this was a piece about us. 
So uh, this one was a really big color theory piece that is really important. Um, this one, I tried to paint the exact same painting uh, with the, uh, the design being the same but reversed and then using the complementary colors but reversed. So I tried to use the painter's color wheel to create an inverse um, conversation between these pieces. So anywhere you see blue, there's orange. Anywhere you see red, there's green and so on and so forth. What I didn't know is that this only works in the painting color field. It doesn't necessarily work in the digital color field because as we know, complements in the painting world and complements in the digital world are two completely different things. If you've taken any of my color theory courses, you'll understand why this piece uh, failed. Because what I did afterwards was I took both of these pieces into Photoshop and I pressed control I on them to invert them and all of the complementary colors were off and I thought I failed. <laughs> so in the digital world, yes, I may have failed this piece. But again, what I'm trying to show you here is just the exploratory nature of uh, of being an artist and, and just experimenting. And people don't need to see these things. You know, take this into your photography and look at ways that you can experiment with colors and how those colors work. Uh, and once you do that, once you get really good at it, you can start predicting how things are going to turn out. So I took that from my painting world and I brought that into uh, my, my photography world. But there was a transition that happened. If you notice, I talked about a lot about my pieces that I did that were me taking pictures of things and taking those pictures and painting them, right? Well, on those trips, I would often go out really late. This was the first photograph that I was really excited about. I mean, this this photograph is like two o'clock in the morning. It's, um, it's, it's on uh, Highway 1 in California on your way towards, um, towards San Francisco from um, Santa Cruz. And it's right on the left-hand side as you're leaving Santa Cruz going towards San Francisco on Highway 1. And I love this drive, and I love doing it at night. So I would start around 9 or 10 o'clock at night, and I would go until 2 o'clock in the morning. So this might have been more towards the beginning of the night because it actually is closer to Santa Cruz. Uh, and I'd go for hours, and I would take pictures. And the funny thing is I had no idea how to do a long exposure. This is 2006. I had no idea how to do a long exposure. I had no idea um, uh, that if I kept my shutter open longer, that the I'd get more light into the image. I mean, I, I was really just kind of playing and just having fun. It was really an excuse for me to get in my car. Um, at the time, I was a smoker. So get in the car, smoke a half pack of cigarettes, and then get to where I needed to go and just enjoy being me and being single, right? Well, I quit smoking when I met my wife. But <laughs> the... Uh, this is the moon. I remember seeing this and I said, wow, I actually photographed the moon shining onto the water. That's amazing. And to you, it's like, this is really bad. If you were to do a critique of Blake here, looking at this from the critique sessions I do, you'd have a, a ton of things to say. And that's great. That's fine. I, I appreciate that. But this was just a way for me to get out with my camera and experiment. I wasn't the best at what I did. I'd never said I was the best at what I did. I just enjoyed it. And I went with it. Um, here you can see I'm in Santa Cruz, just shooting around at the at night. Knowing what I know about Santa Cruz now, it probably wasn't the smartest thing to do, uh, but I did it and I enjoyed it. I had a lot of fun, and then I started to really get into photography. So as my photography transitioned from me just taking pictures for my paintings, it started to transition into me taking pictures and actually enjoying the pictures. So I remember I remember very specifically this one sunset in 2007. I remember how just magnificent this sunset was it was so gorgeous it was so beautiful i i got grabbed my camera i did some long exposures but i could not for the life of me i could not get my image to look like what i wanted it to look like so i i almost started to give up on this landscape thing i said you know what you you're just not cut out for this landscape stuff you're not going to be able to do it because if you can't make this look like what you saw then you're not going to be able to cut it. Sorry. And it's true. I mean, that's kind of how, that's why I teach you the way I teach you now. Uh, but in this transitionary period, I did what most photographers do, where they give up on one artistic style of, let's say, landscape photography. And they say, well, I love the camera. So I pick something else up. So I did what anybody would do. I went to Craigslist and I put an ad out that basically said, I'm your guy to photograph anything. <laughs> business advice. Um, do not take this 101. <laughs> okay. Uh, and, and I put this ad out that I would just photograph anything. And the first hit I got, this guy was willing to pay me $250. And to me at that time, I was, I would have done it for 25, but he was going to pay me $250 to come out and photograph a winter ball. And a winter ball is kind of like a prom. 
I didn't really know what I was getting into. So he said, do you have any lights? I said, yes, I've got lights. Well, I didn't have lights. I went on to amazon.com and I ordered some cowboy studio lights, which I don't suggest ordering. Again, business advice, do not take 101. Um, I ordered some cowboy studio, very, very poor lighting. And I brought it to his house and I acted like I knew what I was doing. Probably my first mistake. But here are the really embarrassing photos that I want to show you from this. So this is what it was. It was basically his daughter over there on the left and 16 or 15 of her friends with their boyfriends going on this winter ball in San Jose. And I was photographing them. And look at the lighting. I did horrible. I did absolutely horrible. And then we look at something like this where, you know, here they all are about to eat their dinner before they go. Yeah, I... <laughs> One and done, right? I, I had shot one and I said, you know what? Never again. I've had enough. I'm not going to do that ever again. So I learned my lesson. I learned my lesson really hard that you can't just pick up a camera and say, I'm going to photograph people. Um, you have to know what makes you tick. You have to know what motivates you. You have to know what 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 makes uh, this whole photography journey and experience for you. So if you're in this situation now where you're transitioning from people to landscape to wildlife to real estate to whatever that might be, you really have to double down on one thing. Um, you can do everything, but you have to dial in on the one thing that's going to make you the most happy. So in 2010, that was, I think that was 2009, maybe early 2010. Um, 2010, right after, uh, right before I went to Photoshop World, I got this picture of Bixby Canyon Bridge and Big Sur uh, on your way uh, towards, um, um, out of Big Sur, I believe, shooting towards Monterey. And uh, I loved it. Like this was the first time that I think I was actually happy with a photograph. A landscape photograph that is. I mean, I, I took this, I processed it, and I said, man, you really have something here. This is what you need to explore. Don't put another Craigslist ad out because it's going to fail. Um, do this. Dial in on this and get good at this. And that was like something that just spoke to me. I said, this is, this is you. This is where you want to be. This is what you got to do. And I had to learn the hard way to get there. But the question I have for you is, do you consider yourself an artist or a photographer? If you're just jumping in, I had I asked this question at the beginning when I go live. Are you an artist or photographer? Raise your hand if you're an artist. Okay, you could be sitting there and say, okay, yes or no. Um, I believe that anyone who is a photographer is an artist. But here's the deal. Most photographers do not consider some, themselves artists. Um, the... The question that I ask every photographer there is if they say, I'm not an artist, I'm a photographer, I say, well, okay, hear me out. If you don't think you're an artist, have you ever solved a problem creatively? And they're like, well, yeah, but what do you mean about photography? I'm like, well, have you ever used duct tape to tape uh, a backdrop to a wall? Well, yeah. Okay, so you, you creatively solved that problem. You had a problem, you needed to fix it, so you creatively solved that problem. Well, I got news for you. All an artist is, if you ever asked an artist, hey, are you an artist? And they, well, yeah. Well, what do you do? I don't know. I just, I, I do things, you know. But the real answer about an artist is it's just a creative problem solver. That's it. You think creatively to solve problems, whatever that problem might be. I remember talking to a friend of mine who was a, a, a graduate student in college, and he said, there is not one single piece out there that can describe what it's like to be an artist. And it was really a, like a, a really philosophical discussion we were having. And then we challenged each other to create a piece of work that would solve the art problem. Because here is, as, as, as artists, I, I consider everything we do as something that tries to solve a problem. And once we think we've solved that problem with a piece of work, we realize how many more problems we have created in that. So I actually created this work. I, I didn't put it in the spread in this uh, PowerPoint, but it was a big question mark made out of question marks. And the title was artist solving one problem at a time. And that really is the answer to being an artist is creative problem solving. And the more problems you solve, the more come up, the more you have to solve. If you ever solved all of them, there'd be no need to be an artist anymore, right? <laughs> so I want you to think like this. I have a t-shirt that's like this. You might have seen it. It's got a little thing on there. It's on Amazon. You go to amazon.com, type in F64 Academy, and you'll see all my t-shirts that come up. But one of them is this one. Hello, my name is Artist. I am a photographer. Pleasure to meet you. So what I want you to gather from this is that you are an artist, all right? Um, you're a photographer, but you're an artist first. 
you're solving problems creatively and you just so happen to do it through the medium of photography. Okay. So how do we find ourselves in that work? How do we find ourselves in that work and, and, and get ourselves to portray ourselves into our work? Cause that's essentially what artists do. They take a piece of themselves. They put it out there for you to see comedians do this all the time. Comedians are basically a direct reflection of who they are on the inside in their standup work on the outside. So we, as artists are very much the same thing. We portray ourselves in our work and you might be thinking, I am not there yet, Blake. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what you're smoking. Well, I got news for you. I've never smoked anything other than cigarettes. The idea here is that the more you consider yourself an artist, the more you will become one and the further away you see yourself as a photographer. I'm going to talk about some technical things about that when I start showing you some of my work. But this is a, a key thing. The more time you spend trying to be someone else as an artist, the farther away you get from yourself as the artist within. And I say that because you might be looking at my work and saying, man, I really wish I could process photos like Blake does. I really wish my work looked like Blake does. And I know you might be thinking that because I did. I used to say, I really wish that I had photos that were as clean and crisp and beautiful as Matt Klaskowski's. He was one of my, uh, my uh, primo uh, mentors way back in the day. Before he even knew who I was, I was watching his stuff to learn how to get beautiful images. But the more I spent trying to become him, the farther away I went from who I was and it just kept getting pushed back and pushed back and pushed back and pushed back. So when you look at artists that you like, don't wish that you could process like them or don't wish that your image came out like theirs. What you can do in that meantime is wish that your style comes out while you follow those individuals. So the first step to considering yourself an artist is just first off, consider yourself an artist. As of today, you no longer call yourself a photographer. Boom, drop the mic, this webinar is over, okay? Have a great day. <laughs> Stop saying I'm just a photographer, okay? What I want you to pull away from this is that you are main category, artist. Subcategory, photographer. Just like um, you know, a business person might work for said company, but in that said company, they are this. So your company is artist. Your job description while you are in that company of artist is photographer. It's a really, it's a crazy thing that happens when you start considering yourself something. Um, I, have you ever heard the term when you label, you enable? So I was in sociology class and our sociology professor studied uh, the labels of prison, uh, prison people that were put into prison, whether they were put there uh, from false accusations or they were actually put there for something that they did wrong. And what he found was that people that were put in jail for, say, 15 years for something like murder. And that person got convicted of murder, but didn't actually commit the murder, but they did the time for it because they were wrongly accused when they came out of jail they murdered someone. Imagine that someone who might have gone to jail, who did not actually go there for that reason, but is there because they were convicted of it for some reason or another, then comes out and murders someone. Why? Because for 15 years, they were in jail labeled as a murderer. So we, we do this with our kids too. Um, a lot of times I tell my kids, I'm proud of them. My son would say, why are you proud of me? Yeah, I didn't even do anything. Why are you proud of me? Well, I'm proud of you because of the things that you have done today. And I know the things that you're going to do. So what I'm doing there is I'm labeling my child as somebody that I am proud of so that when he does something, um, he's doing it uh, because he wants to, to make me feel proud. So in turn, he's going to make good decisions that are going to make me feel proud. I'm labeling him as a child that makes me happy, not as a child that upsets me. See the difference there. If I labeled him as a child that upsets me, guess what? He's going to act out. He's going to do all kinds of crazy things, and I'm not going to have any control over him. So I'm labeling him in a certain way that I know he's going to act. And it's, it's a crazy thing that happens psychologically. So if you're just saying, I'm just Blake, I don't do anything. I'm just Blake. Then you're only going to be just Blake. But if you say, I'm an artist, you become an artist. When you label, you enable, and you become what it is that you want to be. So if you're labeling yourself a photographer, that's great. That, that's a good start. But now go one up. I'm an artist photographer. Even if you have to hyphenate that, like your artist and your photographer got married and they hyphen their name instead of taking one over the other. If you want to do that, that's fine. Artist photographer, I can agree with that. But you're an artist, then a photographer, okay? What I want you to take away from that first and foremost is that you are a creative problem solver. Whatever you're doing in Photoshop, that's a creative, that's a problem that you're having in your image that you need to fix. You become a creative problem solver. So because you create, you, you solve problems creatively, guess what? You're an artist. Boom. Done. Easy. Okay. 
Let that be your first label to enable you to become more. A lot of people think that an artist, the word artist means that you are more than more capable than somebody else because you have the term artist on you. And that's not necessarily the case. Anybody who is an artist, especially in the painting world, they'd be like, dude, I just paint and I just like it. Okay. You know, it's, and they'll give you a reason why they do what they do. Um, but for the most part, it's not like someone has to deem you and qualify you as an artist. You qualify you as an artist. Nobody else is going to come along and say, wow, you're an artist. And I know that because of my qualifications as being an artist. Someone doesn't call and someone doesn't come and knight you with a, with a paintbrush and say you're an artist. Okay. It's up to you to do that. Okay. So that's your first step. Your first step to finding yourself in your work is becoming that artist. Your second thing is your strengths. You have to find what you're strong in and you've got to double down on them. You've got to double down on your strengths and be aware of your weaknesses. I went through this whole presentation telling you about my strengths and weaknesses. My strengths being in color theory and painting and landscape photography. And what weakness did I show you? people photography. I know that's my weakness. So I double down on my strengths. I get really good at my strengths. I'm aware of my weaknesses and I know where I can get better. We have to know what our weaknesses are. It's just like in the movies where you got these people like, like the Avengers and they're battling uh, the bad guy and they're battling him for the first three, eight, two, right? Say two hours of the movie and they can't figure out what takes this bad guy down. Well, they're battling against that bad guy's strengths. Then someone comes along and whispers in their ear and says, hey, the weakness is right here in the center of their chest. Oh, okay. Well, let me go for that. Boom. There we go. Take down the giant from the weakness. You don't try to use your strengths there. So you don't want your, you need to be aware of your weaknesses so that you don't get taken down by them and you double down on your strengths to protect yourself from your weaknesses. But at the same time, also make sure your weaknesses get some growth, but you can't do that until you tell yourself what your strengths are and what your weaknesses are. Even if you have to get a sticky note like this, like get, get yourself a sticky note, write down my strengths, write down my weaknesses and go from there. This thing here goes along with your strengths. Do not try to be somebody else. We've already talked about this. We talked about, you know, finding um, your style and not wishing that your style was somebody else's. Don't try to be someone else because that's not going to focus on your strengths. It's going to focus on somebody else's strengths. You can't focus on somebody else's strengths. You've got to focus on yours. You can try to emulate their style. That, that's okay. Um, but don't make their style your style. The thing about my painting, why I don't like my painting is I just didn't like my brush strokes. I didn't like the way my hand and my eye work together to paint. But you know why I didn't like that? Because I was trying to be Van Gogh or Dali. And guess what? I'm not Dali. I'm not Van Gogh. I'm sure as crap, not Leonardo da Vinci, but I'm Blake Rudis. So if I would have just accepted my painting style, guess what? I probably would have grown into it and really learned to enjoy it. But because I was trying to emulate another painter's style, I never fully understood my strengths as a painter. And that's a sad thing. And I don't want to see you be that photographer who does the same thing, who tries to be somebody else, focuses so much on somebody else's style, and then doesn't come in and, and really hone and work on your own. You've got to move towards what speaks to you. Guess what doesn't speak to me? People photography. I cringe. Ask my wife. All the pictures I take throughout the year, barely any of my kids. I've got a beautiful family. But I just, it's, I don't do that. I don't operate that way. I can't think that way. So what speaks to me is landscape photography. The third step and finding yourself in your work is seeking your emotions. This is very difficult. Uh, when I speak to this, I'm speaking to this, I don't want to sound sexist in any way, shape or form, but um, we, I, I think about like my dad's era and how he grew up and his father, I should say, so my grandfather, and how fathers were very reserved. They went to work uh, for the most part. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm being slightly sexist and slightly um, stereotypical here. So my dad's dad went to work. He came home. He ate dinner. He did his thing. He had kids. He respected them. But that was about it. You know, the, he didn't really show them the the love that I, I show my kids. He loved them. My dad knew he loved him. But it was just a different way. So what I'm getting at with that is that men typically have a harder time finding that emotive side in them to double down on. But if you want to become an artist, you've got to wear your heart on a sleeve. It sucks. Um, I want you to cry. <laughs> Even if something doesn't work out, cry. Who cares? 
You got to get that emotion out and you've got to seek your emotions. You've, you've got to go with your gut when it comes to shooting, processing, and style. See, the thing is, if you're not comfortable seeking out your emotions, how are you going to know what your gut is telling you to do about shooting, processing, and your style? You're not. You're going to be sitting there trying to, to create something and you haven't tapped into the one thing that's going to help you create that, which is your emotions. When, when I go to a scene and I look at it, I get overwhelmed by it. So what I try to do is I try to take that overwhelming joy that I have for the landscape and put it out into my processing and the style that I create for that image. Sometimes that's gritty. Sometimes it's grungy. Sometimes it's light, airy, and delicate. Sometimes that's highlights blowing out. Ooh, God forbid a highlight blows out. <laughs> Sometimes I just look at that scene and I say, okay, I know exactly how I'm going to process it. But I know that because I sought my emotions when I was at that scene and I can tap into those emotions anytime I want whenever I'm reminded of that image. And if we want to create the best images that we can for everybody else, we have to be able to seek those emotions. So if you're one of those people that seems very reserved and doesn't like to talk about things and doesn't like to come out, I would highly honestly suggest some therapy. Really, I mean, I've been through therapy sessions before uh, to get my emotions out, to get me to a point where I'd be comfortable with my emotions. I'm not ashamed of it. There's nothing wrong with it. It's a third party, a person that can sit there and help you pull those emotions out to feel things that you've never felt before. And this can help you with your work. You might think, well, how, how can seeking my emotions about this topic help me with my art? Well, the more comfortable you are with your emotions, the easier it is to seek them out when you're working on your art. So I want you to rely more on your emotions and your gear. <gasps> oh, this is a tough one. <laughs> really? It doesn't matter if you have a Sony a7R 3 or a point and shoot camera or a cell phone camera. Um, your emotions are going to be more powerful than the gear that's in your hand. And that can be a very um, humbling concept. You don't need the best of the best. You just need this and this. You use these two things together and it doesn't matter what gear you have. I don't care if you've got a Sony a7 R3 with a 16 to 35 f 2.8 lens or a, even if you have a Hasselblad or a phase one, I don't care because if I had a phase one, what I could do with that with my emotions is more powerful than what I could do with that gear alone. Okay. The emotions and what I seek out when I'm in that are going to be what create the work, not the gear. The gear doesn't create the work. I create the work. Does good gear help? Yeah, it helps but it's not necessary. You can give me a Polaroid and I can create just as good of an image as I could with, uh, with some heavy duty gear because I'm seeking emotions. I'm not seeking gear. So don't shy away from these emotions. That's the biggest thing. These emotions are going to be a reflection of you. And that's what carries on throughout your pieces. You seek those things out so that you can reflect yourself in your work. Otherwise there's going to be a, a, a I always talk about the conversation that happens between the, the, the piece the artist and the viewer, right? Um, and if you don't put your emotions in it, guess what? That conversation is very boring. If I just talked to you like this and said, I like art, art's very fun. I like to paint. I like to take pictures. Then you'd sit here and be like, this webinar is done. <laughs> I'm, I'm done with it. I don't even want to sit here through this, but because I'm, I'm putting some passion into it, I'm showing you a reflection of myself, not just in my work, but also in the way I present it. Look at the difference between that. You know, I'm giving you all of that emotion I possibly can. It's, it's physically and mentally draining sometimes, especially when I'm doing it for an entire day. But it should be. Showing your emotions should be physically and mentally draining. Putting that into your work should be physically and mentally draining. Here's the big thing. Guess what? If you're not happy with it, the viewer will not be happy with it. Someone told me once when I first had my first son, if the baby's crying, it's probably because they're uncomfortable. So if you're uncomfortable holding the baby, the baby's going to be uncomfortable with you holding them. So I learned real quick that the reason why my son would go to my wife over me is because she was more comfortable holding him. So as soon as I got more comfortable holding him, guess what? He actually wanted to be with me because he felt the comfort that I had in holding him. Now with three sons, I can, you know, just toss that comfort right there. I love it. Love holding my little man. <laughs> so in all of this, you should not be defined by your work. Your work should be defined by you. You should not, you personally should not be defined by your work. You should be the one that says, this is my work and I define it by what I put into it. So here's some examples. And you know, as a, as a technician of photography, when I look at this image, I say, okay, I like some, th some things here. I like some things here, but dude, that sky is a little blown out to the left, you know, but as an artist, I like it. 
the emotion that comes through with that big bright spot there that just beams over the entire image, it works. But as a technician of a photograph, is this technically perfect? No, but who cares? Because as an artist, when I look at this, I say, wow, there's some magic happening there and I can go with that. Here's another thing. An artist will walk into a room, <laughs> a very boring room and see something that just speaks to them. This staircase spoke to me when I saw it in this house, a house that was built in 1890. Beautiful staircase, original staircase. I think they just restained it because there were some kids that lived there before that. Beautiful staircase, and it just spoke to me. And then, because it speaks to me, and because I put some color grading into this, and I put me into it, it then speaks to you. This this picture sits above my stairwell as you go down my basement um, stairs. It's above the stairs uh, in the middle of the house. Every person that walks down the stairs says, that's a beautiful staircase. Where is that? It's a staircase. <laughs> Come on. But there's something that's speaking to them when they see it because I put my emotions into it. If you saw the, the beginning of this, it, it wasn't that great. But I put my emotions into it. I, I, as an artist, came out, put myself into that so that I could create this for them. Here's another example about creative problem solving as an artist. We go to Yosemite. We go to Tunnel View. Beautiful view. Absolutely gorgeous, right? You come out of that tunnel and it's just like kapow smacks you in the face. We get there, we leave at 3.30 in the morning so we could get there at 5.30, uh, actually about five, and get set up for 5.30 for the sunrise. And we couldn't tell if there's any clouds or not that day. So we get into Yosemite and guess what? There's no clouds. Looks horrible. Big, bright blue sky with nothing. Well, as a creative problem solver, guess what? I took some clouds from later on in that day when the clouds did decide to show up because that's what they do every day in Yosemite. I put those clouds into the image from what happened in the afternoon to make the image what I wanted it to be in the morning. As, an, as a technician of a photograph, is that wrong? Maybe you think so. I don't because I'm an artist. All you see at the end of this is what I, the artist, am showing you, right? So as long as I do it well and I do it in a way that you can't tell that it was composited, then it works, right? I think so because you'd never know unless I told you that. Here's another example, perfect example, creative problem solving. I wanted that HDR look, but I also wanted a long exposure. If you take the ND long exposure course here on F64 Elite, you'll see uh, this exact spot actually uh, shot from a different angle, but it's a long exposure mixed with an HDR image. And guess what? The sky was blown out here too. So what did I do? I dropped in clouds from another location that actually looked better that day than they did here. But is it cheating? You don't know. As long as you do it well and the artist shows you a good representation of that, it doesn't matter, right? As a technician of a photograph, is that wrong? Maybe. I don't know. But as an artist, I don't care. Technicians are typically those people. This pisses me off to no end. Sorry, I'm getting up, I'm getting heated now. Uh, but when I hear people talk about camera clubs and them not accepting images that have been photoshopped. <gasps> oh my gosh. Who gives a rat's ass, all right? <laughs> I, I'm not a technician. I'm an artist. Okay. I'm an artist photographer. So be, because they've got something against photoshopped images, what they call Photoshop, which shouldn't be a verb anyway, there's, that's wrong because Ansel Adams did this stuff. He double stacked and triple stacked his, his exposures to get beautiful images. But do those individuals look at him and criticize him for it? No, they think he's a God. So why would they look at you any different? All right, that, okay, I'll get off my high horse. I'm done <laughs> getting off that high horse. Um, all right, so this image, um, this image was from uh, Yosemite as well, taken from Glacier Point. So what I did here was I photographed the moon from up here and I photographed the moon at like 300 millimeters. And then because the moon was maybe three quarters the size of it is here, I decided to drop in that moon and make it a little bit bigger. Not so big that it looks like this crazy moon composite that could never happen, but something that you look at that and go, oh, wow, that's pretty cool. But you'd never know the difference. During our critique session, because everyone was there, um, everyone was standing in the same spot, everyone just thought that I used an 800 millimeter lens to really pull that moon <laughs> up with all the mountains. But I didn't have an 800 millimeter lens with me in order to have a teleconverter to do that. Um, so during the critique session, they said, "How? what lens did you use to get the moon to be so close with all that other stuff. I said, well, I really didn't. And I showed them the before and after and they never knew the difference. But all of these people were standing in the same spot that I was and saw the same thing that I did and believed that that actually was the way that that photograph turned out. As a technician, I would not have done that. 
as a technician of a photograph, I would not have done that. I would have said that's unacceptable and I wouldn't have done it. But as an artist, knowing how I felt when I saw that scene, I can bring that stuff back out. I can resurrect it and I can put it there so that you can see it. Here's another example as an artist. As an artist, we gotta put ourselves out there, even if that means taking our shirt off every once in a while. So this is right after I quit my job in 2014. Um, I, um, I, I was very stressed out, but didn't know it. So I was having these heart palpitations that like my heart would kind of skip a beat and then kind of like I would feel this almost like like air was being taken from my chest type feeling. So my wife, being the lovely woman that she is, says, Blake, I need you to go to your doctor and find out what's going on with you. And I was like, nah, I'm fine. I'm, I'm, I'm a man. <laughs> I'm fine. I don't need to go to the doctor. But again, I let my emotions take me there. Went to the doctor. They put me on a heart monitor. So here I am, 31 years old on a heart monitor <laughs> thinking that, I really had a, a serious problem. So if anyone's familiar with Marvel comic books and Wolverine, I decided that because every morning when I woke up and looked at myself in the mirror with this thing on for a couple of days, I looked like Wolverine as he's busting out of, uh, of uh, the place that he was in captive, captivity when they were putting all of his adamantium in his, in his body. I felt like him. So I was like, you know, what? I'm going to do a composite that makes me look like Wolverine with claws coming out, busting out of the Missouri State Penitentiary. As an artist, I'm putting myself out there. I'm putting a self-portrait, literally putting myself onto this image. But it's also not just a self-portrait of me physically. It's a self-portrait of my tenacity in my business to keep going and rip through whatever is going to get in my way. You see, you can pull these things together. Put yourself in your work. Don't be afraid to do it. Um, even when you've got laser pointers all over you of people that are about to shoot you down, you're still going to push through. That's what this piece is about. And yeah, it's a very literal composite, but you know what? It's fine. It doesn't have to always be abstract. Here was a, a tree that I shot recently in uh, Olympic, and I must have taken 150 to 250 shots of this tree. I was there for like 40 minutes. <laughs> I was there with my buddy, Jerry Johnson, and I was just shooting this tree for a while, <laughs> a very long time, going every angle that I could take on this tree, just shooting, 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 shooting as many shots as I could get until I captured the personality of that shot. But this tree spoke to me. It spoke to me in the time that I saw it. And I didn't stop until I got it. As a technician, if I just took the one photograph and said, okay, I got that tree, it's good to go. I get into post later and I realized it didn't really work. It took me that many shots to find how the personality of that tree matched my personality as an artist and what I wanted to portray. Let the scene speak to you that way. Seek that emotion, find that emotion within you and try to figure out how you can put that out there so people can see it. So here's a really cool phrase. I use this all the time. And anytime I think that I am where I wanted to be, where I want to be in my business or in my photography or in my style, my processing, I say to myself, I am where I wanted to be five years ago, but I'm not where I want to be five years from now. Five years ago, I wanted to be doing exactly what I'm doing right now. I did. I wanted to be teaching people photography, teaching people to be artists and teaching people to be the best of what they could be on paper. Uh, but I'm not where I want to be in five years. So I always have something to strive for. You can do the same thing in your work. Maybe business isn't the thing that you're worried about right now. Maybe the thing you're worried about is becoming an artist. Well, think of this as your ground zero. And I want you to say, okay, five years from now, I want to have a bulletproof style that's absolutely gorgeous, that speaks to everyone when they see my pictures. Boom, drop the mic, that is it. But then five years from now, I want you to go there and look back and say, you know what? I finally made it here, but where do I want to be in another five years? Five-year goals are really powerful. I have, I have placed five-year goals on everything I do with the expectation of myself to break it in three. So I'm very strict on myself to break those, those five-year goals um, and, and, and do them in a lot less time. Because then once I get there, I can, I can keep going and keep going and keep going and keep going and never stop. It's all about progression and getting better and going forward. So if it's about your work, if it's about your business, if it's about your relationships with your kids or with your wife, I know for a fact, I love where my wife and I are right now in our, in our relationship, but I'm not where I want to be with her in five years from now. Five years from now, I want us to be exponentially greater than where we are right now. I don't want our relationship to plateau. So what do I have to do as a husband to make that happen? 
how do we how do we both do that as a as a married couple to to go from just being complacent in our marriage to exponentially getting greater every I don't even want that to happen every five years I want that to happen every year so you see that this isn't just a phrase that can be used on your art and your artwork this can be used on everything that you have in your life the great thing about this is when you start working this mentality you will always get better at what it is that you want to get better at period hands down because again you're labeling your goals for the future and enabling yourself to fulfill them it's it's powerful it's really powerful so this is what we talked about we reflected on you what's your motivation what do you want to do with your life what do you want to do with your art what do you want to do with your photography where do you want to be we found out that i really liked taking pictures of landscapes after i photographed my very first winter ball <laughs> it was bad it was really bad right so are you an artist or a photographer right now you better be sitting at your seat saying i'm a freaking artist and put that adjective there i'm an artist and i'm a photographer if you want to hyphenate that because it makes you more comfortable in that marriage concept artist photographer hyphenated go ahead but put artist first please subcategory photographer how do we find yourself in your work you've got to consider yourself an artist you've got to know your strengths and double down on them and you've got to go with your gut because when you show people that, that's when your stuff is going to be showcased. That's when it's going to come out. So I'm going to go ahead and transfer back over to the webcam, just the webcam, and answer any questions you might have on finding yourself in your work. Please try not to make them technical questions. Try to make them questions that are more geared towards, um, you know, the, the emotion, right? Let's start seeking out that emotion now. So don't say, Blake, how do I use a curves adjustment layer to make my art better? <laughs> okay, don't do that. Um, so Lillian says, what about some artists that inspire me? Um, you know, in this day and age, I think it's very difficult for me to find people that inspire me. Uh, when I was learning photography, it was really um, the likes of Matt Klaskowski and Trey Ratcliffe. But as my style grew, um, I started to shy away from more of the people in this world, at, well, at this day and age, I should say. And I actually seek out a lot of people from the past. I like the Group F64 individuals like um, um, Weston, Amagan Cunningham, um, Ansel Adams. I consider those a lot of my mentors. You know, those are people that I read a lot of their stuff from the 80s and from the 60s and from the 40s. And I learn about photography specifically from those individuals because photography has taken a weird type of transition from where it was uh, 50 years ago to where it is now. And photography was very much a strict photography art form and not necessarily a mixed media. Once we started to get into the digital world, things got a little bit different. So the artists that I seek out in the photography world would be people like I, I, Ansel Adams, hands down, one of my biggest inspirations for landscape. And on the painting side of things, um, um, I like um, Van Gogh. Da Vinci for his mind. I know that these are, sound like a lot of people that you're, you're used to, uh, but those are the individuals that I really like. Rothko. Rothko um, did a lot of stuff with color theory, and I really liked his color theory things. So I draw inspiration more, I think, from the landscape than I do from actual, actual people. Um, but I needed people to start that. So let's see here. How do you motivate yourself to be so full of energy all the time? Well, I don't know. <laughs> Business wise, I think it's because of my kids. You know, I, I, I am doing what I'm doing now because I want my kids to live um, a certain way. And I feel like if I don't keep going, then I'm going to fail them in some way, shape or form. So business wise, I keep myself motivated by something exterior from myself. That exterior thing is my family. They keep me motivated on the business side. On the art side to stay motivated, I'm always working at ways to, to better my workflow. And I experiment a lot. I ex a lot of my motivation comes from experimentation. So if there's something I want that I like, um, I don't really find if I like something a lot until I experiment with it. And then I go, oh, look at that. Look at that. Oh, I love it. I love it. And that motivates me to keep going and going and going and going and going. Um, what also motivates me is getting out with my camera, just going out in the landscape and doing what it is that I love. Um, and those are the things that keep me, keep me going. Uh, let's see here. We've got Eric. I've gone so far as to reinforce my desire to be an artist by creating a watermark that reinforces the blend of photography and artistry. So, um, yeah, 
you know, when it comes to watermarks, I don't, I don't really, I don't really use watermarks in my work, uh, especially when I'm showing them to people, because I think that that kind of distracts from the art as it is. Although painters always would sign their work, so that's a good thing if that keeps you motivated, keep doing it. If I see a technique I truly like, um, is it allowable to incorporate it into your own and modify it to your standards? Absolutely, Mark. So one of the things that I really like is I like the, um, what's that? Um, there's a certain effect that I'm trying to think about here. It's it's an effect that makes things kind of blurry looking in your photographs. Oh, forget the guy's name. Uh, I'll, I'll, when it comes up, but yes. So what I'll do is I'll look at a style that I like and I'll see ways that I can incorporate that into my own style and make it my own uh, through those different techniques. Uh, I don't like to copy people's techniques. I don't like to blatantly copy someone and then say it's mine. Um, I will throw my spins on it. And you see that a lot in my panels. If you click a button and it pulls up a lot of different panels that do a lot of different things, those are inspired by other things that I've seen somewhere else, but that I've incorporated into my own style. So yes, it's okay to emulate but don't copy, don't blatantly copy. Some people would say it's okay to blatantly copy, that the artists are the best thieves, but I don't agree with that. Um, let's see, this is really good. Uh, really a good call to balance the learning technique with inner vision. Sometimes I see something that touches me and think, wow, that would be a great photo, but then I hesitate because I don't have the confidence to translate the scene well. Exactly, so Madeline, you're, you're right on point. That's where seeking out that emotion about what that thing makes you feel will help you. The technical things are important, the emotions are important as well. You use the emotions to feel something, you use the technical stuff to make you to make the viewer feel what you felt. So it's a mix of both. You've got to have a good balance of technique and that inner vision to pull those things together. I just wanted to personally tell you that I enjoyed your Creative Live bootcamp. Thanks, Henry. That was awesome. I enjoy writing and I enjoy writing about what I know and what I feel about a location, a scene, anything that gives a sense of place. I find myself wanting to make my photographs complement the writing, but I find myself lacking the motivation to get the images I want. What would be your advice to kickstart my motivation to get it done? Again, seek out that emotion. What you have there, Daniel, I think is a really awesome concept of a photo book where you have your photo over here and you have your writing over here. So you are already writing these emotions out. You're feeling these emotions about this place. So here is where you need to get a good proper marriage of technique and feeling. You've got the emotions down. That's a, that's a hard thing to do. So kudos to you on that one. So now how do you use some of the techniques that I teach you to help you pull those things out? And a lot of times it happens with color grading and color theory and pulling all those things together to get a good marriage between technique and artistry. But I think what you've got now by the writings, that would be a killer photo book. That would be a book that I would love to buy from you to see your images from where you are and what you're writing about them to get those. Because a lot of times we just see the image and we don't get that conversation from the artist. That would be a really cool book. I'd love to read that. Um, artists can be defined by any number of activities. Cake decorators can be artists. I think giving it the proper title enables one as do you. Yeah, exactly. So my wife. She makes these killer macaroons. She is an artist of macaroons. They are gorgeous. They are beautiful. They taste delectable. That's an art form. I can't do it. She's an artist when it comes to baking. She really is. Her cookies are beautiful too, and they're very good. Um, so Donald, I've been following you pretty much from the beginning of HDR. I used to try to come up with photos like yours. I've gotten away from that, and now I'm doing my own style of photography. Not a question, just a statement. Thanks for all you do. Awesome. So this is a perfect example. So I was the same way. I did HDR because I wanted images like Trey Ratcliffe's. I mean, who else did that? I did it. Um, but that's okay. And just like Donald here, I found that in that process, I found my style by emulating somebody else. But if I wasn't cognizant of my own style while I was working towards somebody else's, I would have lost me in that process. I would have been frustrated and I would have just stopped working and I would have just stopped doing. So you have to try to emulate others in a way to get good images. If I told you not to emulate my work, that would mean that you would never watch my courses, right? <laughs> so I can't, I can't tell you to do that because you know that's part of the business. Uh, but the thing is, I want you to take what I teach, take what Jim Wilninski teaches, te take what Matt Kleskowski teaches. Those are three of my, two of my best friends in this industry. Take what they teach, take what I teach, put it all together so you get all these techniques and you'll start to see your style coming out as you try to emulate all three of us combined. That's what you focus on. You focus on that style that's come out from you working through other people's processes. There's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. What I don't want you to do is I don't want you to get frustrated and agitated with yourself when you see my stuff and your stuff doesn't come out the same way. Don't do that. 
that's self-defeating and I don't want you to be self-defeating. Do I ever go back and re-edit my past work? That's a great thing. Oh, yes. Uh, so that effect that I was talking about, someone just said it in the comments, the Orton effect. So I take this Orton effect thing and I make it the Blake effect. Um, you're going to see in the new palette effects, I've taken the concept of the Orton effect and I've re-engineered it for what I like in my works. And that's going to be in palette effects 2.0. Um, but yes, uh, the Orton effect. So this one, um, do you ever go back and edit your stuff uh, from the past to try and match your current state of art? So yes, that's a great practice. Actually, when I'm in my pits of demotivation, where I'm like, eh, you suck, Blake. Why do you keep doing this to yourself? Why do you keep trying to be better? That That's healthy. That's normal. We're going to do that to ourselves. What I want you to do when you do that, look at what day it is. Today is April 25th, 2017. I will go back in my folders to five years ago. And I'll pull up one of those images from April 25th, 2000 and oh, I say 2018. Wow, I'm in the wrong year. I'll go back to 2013 and pull up one of those images and I'll work on it. And I'll see what my style is now compared to what it was then. And I get so much motivation looking at those images and saying, wow, look at how different these are. They're both great, but look at where I've come from where I was. Definitely do that. That's a great practice. Um, has anyone left their current job so they could pursue the photography avenue, et cetera, full time? I'd love to do it, but I'm concerned about falling backwards financially. Laura, that's a great thing. Um, gosh, I could do a whole webinar on just that. Um, I quit my job in 2014. It's actually the four year anniversary was at the beginning of this month. It was nerve wracking. It was scary. It was a leap of faith. It was one of those things that I basically quit on a paycheck of like $2,000 from a Topaz webinar um, when they allowed me to uh, mention something from one of my courses that I'd done and I had a lot of sales come in really quickly. And my wife and I both looked at each other and said, yep, you can reproduce this. Uh, you have to work hard. I'll be honest with you. Uh, I haven't worked harder for anybody else and I've worked for myself. I'm, I'm more cognizant of, um, of my work ethic now, I think. And I know that if I don't work hard, then my family doesn't eat. So it's tough, but would I ever look back? Pfft, heck no. I love it. I love it. Um, now pursuing actual photography of taking pictures of people based on this webinar, would you say Blake could do that? <laughs> I don't answer that question. Okay. Let's see. Um, um, uh, so some people are getting back to you on that one. Uh, could I share a creative technique that, uh, to make an idea from somebody else, your own idea without copying the other artists work? Um, uh, that's a tough one. I mean, you have to look at what it is that you like about it and and just figure out how to create that for your own work. So when I was looking at, let's say, um, Van Gogh's paint strokes, I loved his paint strokes. Well, how did he get there? Well, he used a thick paint. Okay, so now I'm just gonna use thicker paint with my paint stroke. So you see, I'm taking some of the elements of that paint stroke and I'm putting it into my own. So um, that's kind of the the the, the the best advice I could give you. Look at what you like about it and try to emulate what you like. Pull in those emotions. Um, so Heike asks, uh, ever given up on an image you cannot get to work? Absolutely. I do it on a daily basis. <laughs> you only see my highlights. You see my Facebook reel. You see everything that makes me look great. <laughs> but yes, I fail just as much as anybody else does. Um, but I look at those small failures as little su great successes. Small failures, great success. What failed in this? Why did it fail? What can I do better on the next thing? Um, when something from another artist inspires me, I'm concerned that my image will look too much like that other artist, making it my own. Uh, is the technical part that's holding me back. There are so many techniques that I get overwhelmed. Exactly. You have to dial in on some some um, really some techniques that, that you can do. Uh, and then once you dial in on those, start branching out. So you build up. It's like it's like Legos. You know, no one buys the Death Star Lego package and says, I'm going to build that. Um, if I did with my sons, there'd be 6,000 pieces and they'd never get it done. But you take the small Lego sets and you build the small Lego sets until you get to the bigger ones. So take the things that you can do, double down on those for a while, and then start branching out to other techniques. And that might help. Let's see here. Thank you, Blake. Thank you. I appreciate you being here. Um, let's see. Love to revisit my old images. Yep. Good thing. Good thing. Um, for all the tech stuff you have taught, this is a refreshing turn for me. Awesome, Sue. 
awesome. I'm really glad. Uh, I'm glad that this could be helpful for you. So um, I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up um, and protect your time. We're at about a little over an hour. Like I said before, I'm going to take this live event uh, that we've done here and I'm going to uh, put it on uh, the F64 Elite website and get everything back online. So if you happen to come in here late because of the uh, the time change thing, um, well, not time change, but the fact that my time changed from my webinar software, I apologize. I'm going to send out a link to everyone for the replay. So uh, feel free to grab that and enjoy. So it looks like we're having some issues anyway here. A lot of people are saying that things have fallen off, the video's lost. So I'm just going to go ahead and call it. Thank you very much for for uh, coming out. I really do appreciate it because I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you guys. So thank you so much. And I'm going to conclude this. Have a great day.